Hey, there's a guy on here named Salt is Life, and he's doing a water change too. Thank you for letting me know the volume works. Great. All right, live stream. Let's do this. Let's do this. I don't want to waste your time. I know you guys have things to do. This looks good. All right. Abigail asks, are you going to do a water change live? No, I'm not going to do that this time um, because uh, I'm not ready. <laughs> but this is a really good topic, and it's a very good topic for people that are uh, switching from fresh water to salt water because apparently freshwater people change water all the time. And saltwater people, uh, we don't change it nearly as much. So I thought we could get into some of the general rules of what I recommend. And of course, I'll take your feedback. I'd love to hear what you have to say as well. Uh, I think weekends are a great time to change water. Jake Atkinson's just said Saturday's a great day to change water. But uh, let's, uh, let's, let's just get right into this topic. <clears throat> The first rule, just in case you don't have time to watch the whole live stream, my basic rule is when you're going to change water, make sure you match salinity, temperature, and pH. If you can match those three, you can pretty much change as much water as you like. And so that's pH, salinity, and temperature. Now why pH? The reason for pH is because that's actually measuring your alkalinity as well. And in the past, if pH was low, I would buffer it up with some baked baking soda, which is also called soda ash. And I would just bring up the pH to the proper level, and then I could just change my water. If you don't do that, if you just kind of ignore your pH, what, what might happen is you might be adding salt water with low alkalinity in it, which would affect your tank. It would affect the corals, especially uh, some of the more sensitive species, like, say, for example, SPS corals. So matching pH would be great. Now, if you don't own a pH meter, I'd recommend you buy one. And uh, pin, American Pinpoint makes a really nice pH meter that you hold it in one hand like a cell phone, and then you have a probe, and you can put it in your barrel of salt water, you can put it in your tank, and you can actually just get instant digital measurements, and you can compare that way. If it's really close, you're good to go. If it's way off, like let's say it's 7.9 uh, pH in the barrel, and your tank is 8.3, that's too much of a swing, I would get it a lot closer. You want temperature to be the same, and you want uh, salinity to be the same. Uh, if you're looking for a little variance, you know, a half a degree off and temperature is okay. It doesn't have to be dead nuts right, but I'd like to get as close as possible, and that's what I recommend. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I did a blog talking about my mixing vat that has about 100 gallons of salt water in it right now, and I do about a 55-gallon water change at a time. And I, I pulled out some water just because it had been circulating for two months, maybe three, and I wanted to see what my water was. So, you know, salinity was 1.026, uh, 1.027. But uh, alkalinity was actually quite low. It was around 6, if I cr remember correctly. So I added some baked baking soda. And let me just explain what that is. You know Arm & Hammer baking soda? You cut open the box, you pour it on a cookie sheet, and you put it in the oven for 45 minutes. And then you take, and I'm sorry, and you put it at a temperature of like 375 for those 45 minutes. And then you can take it out, let it cool, and you can pour it into an airtight container like a, a, a Rubbermaid, Tupperware, you know, something like that. You know, those little uh, plastic uh, Ziploc cases that lunch meat comes in these days, you can use that to store it in. And that keeps it nice and dry. And the reason you baked it was to drive the CO2 out of the powder. So you're getting rid of the carbon dioxide, and you have now just, because you baked it, made soda ash. And a box of that stuff's 99 cents. I can't think of a cheaper way to get alkalinity <laughs> than to buy Arm & Hammer baking soda and bake a box of it and uh, then store it and use a teaspoon at a time. So on my big container, I put in, uh, again, the blog is two weeks ago, so I, don't, I, didn't remember it, uh, I didn't memorize it, but I can always refer to it later to verify facts. But the bottom line is, you know, I put in a little too much, and it ended up raising my alkalinity all the way to 12. So I checked it again today, and guess what? After two weeks, and I was curious what would happen, after two weeks it had dropped back down to seven. So I'm going to have to add a little bit today before my water change because I checked my tank, and my tank is measuring at eight, which is also a little lower than I'm used to as well. But I'm using the, uh, the used calcium, uh, the uh, corals that we pulled out from my reef back in September, and I, you know, I baked them in the sun, I rinsed them with a lot of water, I let them dry out, I crushed them, and I put them in the calcium reactor. 
and I just don't think they're as potent as the normal media that I would typically buy, like Reborn from Two Little Fishies or ARM from Carib Sea. So I will have to change the melting point so that it melts at a lower pH in the reactor, which will give me more alkalinity and bring the number up a little bit higher. But bottom line is, I know the alkalinity of my salt water, I know the alkalinity of my reef, and now I can make sure that they are correct. Let me uh, take a look at some of your messages because I've just been talking and ignoring the uh, chat. And hit that on the screen while I'm doing it. Let me scroll up here for a minute and see what all you've been saying. Uh, one person asked me, why am I doing one? <laughs> it's a great question. I very rarely do water changes. They are not a uh, priority in my life. And there are uh, methods available these days, like the Triton method, where they just say, never do a water change again. The general rule for saltwater hobbyists is to change 25% of your water once a month. Uh, some people are employing the method of having it change a little bit every single day, like 1% or 2% of their total water volume, and they use a couple of dosing pumps. And they pump some water out, and they pump some water in, and they do this every single day. Or they set it up to do it once a week automatically. But typically, saltwater tanks don't have to change water nearly as much as I believe, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, freshwater people change their water every single week, and they change a lot of it every single week, where... We aren't really needing to change that much because most of what uh, is in the salt water is good for all of our livestock. You know, we supplement with some extra things like alkalinity and calcium, magnesium, possibly iodine. But, and then we replenish what evaporates to keep salinity right. But there's not really a, a necessary need to pull out water and replace it. Now, of course, any company that sells salt for a living is going to tell you, no, change as much water as possible. And, you know, I, I understand why they would say that. But livestock-wise, I mean, you guys have seen my reef. I post pictures daily from my tank. I posted some really nice pictures on my Mila's Reef page on Facebook, which is right here. If you're not following me there, you should be. And uh, I posted a really close-up macro of the uh, shadow caster. Uh, today I posted another picture of the end of my tank. Matter of fact... My blog on Milo's Reef has some very nice pictures in there from this week because I've been kind of on a camera binge. It's kind of funny. I will go through a lot of time where I don't take any pictures and then I start taking pictures like crazy and then I stop again. And, uh, you know, probably in a month or so, I'll start taking top-down pictures where I take a picture from above through a, uh, an iPhone floater or through a, a top-down photo box where I actually mount my, my Nikon camera and shoot through a clear window that gets great shots of the corals. But back to water. Uh, why would you need to change water in the first place? I mean, why does Triton say you don't have to change it ever again? Over time, the more your fish pee and poop into the water, the more toxicities can rise. So an easy cure or easy fix is to remove that salt water and put in fresh to replenish lost nutrients, uh, lost uh, elements. Uh, not really nutrients, sorry. Uh, elements. And uh, it kind of helps reset the tank if things are getting a little out of whack. So whenever the tank's really acting up, really going wrong, big water changes are usually your cheapest solution to anything. If you were to say, well, I'm going to add a bottle of this, I'm going to add a bottle of that, I'm going to add a bottle of this, and you start adding up what did it cost you for those bottles, you might discover that salt water was actually the cheaper solution. But you have to also make sure that the water you're putting in is just as good as it's uh, advertised to be. And if you are mixing up a batch of salt and you're not testing it, you're going to end up hurting your reef. And I'm going to go back to the story that I tell every so often because it, you know, it happened. Uh, there was a fish store in Arkansas, and he had an 800-gallon reef, and it was just going downhill, and he couldn't figure out why. So he kept changing water and changing water and changing water and changing water, and the tank just kept crashing, crashing, crashing. And he thought, what is going on? And he told himself, well, I need to go back to the basics... Let me test my salt water that I just mixed. And that's when he discovered it had zero or one alkalinity. It was a bad batch of salt that went out to the nation. And he was really upset with, you know, good reason. He was upset because he was losing 800 gallons worth of reef, that is his show tank, 
that you know advertises how his company and his store runs and he was furious with the brand of salt and you know I it made sense he contacted me he says Mark you use that same salt right and I said yeah I do but I'm not having any problems when actually I was but I didn't know it because I measured the pH and I added the baked baking soda or soda ash which raised the alkalinity up where it belonged before I put it in my tank and I just assumed it was something to do with trapped uh, you know it was dead winter and I don't let fresh air in my house. <laughs> this is my air. And because of it, you know, CO2 builds up, which can depress pH. And I just thought, wow, pH is really low in here. I'm going to keep adding baked baking soda until it comes up to 8.3 and I'll do my water change. And so my reef never skipped a beat because of my habit of testing the salt water before I put it in my tank. If you're buying your salt water at the fish store, um, or if you're mixing your own, you should still be testing it. And I know that might seem like a beating, it really depends how much salt water you're making too. Like if you go to the store and you bring them five jugs and they give you 25 gallons of salt water and you watch them do it, you know it's all the same batch. You don't have to check five jugs. Test one. If you're mixing up a batch of 55 gallons of salt water in a trash can, you want to test that at the beginning. And in theory, every batch you make after that from the same, uh, I should say box or bucket of salt, should measure the same. So if you buy a box of 200 gallon mix of salt, of salt mix, then you mix up your first batch, you measure everything, and then you can put a little piece of tape on the side of the box and you can write down what the parameters were. You can write down when you open the box, you know, those kind of facts. But you know you tested it. You didn't just trust that it's fine because that's the, fine is the worst word we can use in this hobby because typically nothing is fine. And we always say it's fine, but obviously it's not when something's going wrong and you say, I don't know why things are going wrong, everything is fine. <laughs> Clearly, you just told yourself something's not fine. So you, it's kind of hard to eliminate that word from our vocabulary. We use it a lot. I mean, people say, how are you? I'm fine. And, you know, that's a lie too. My back hurts. You know? but <laughs> so it's really important to know what's going on with your salt mix. And so if you can test the first time you open the bucket, first time you tear open the bag, that would be smart. And once it's done and you're going to a new bag that you picked up, a new batch from the store, you know, a different, uh, uh, what, am I, what am I thinking of? A different run from the manufacturer, test again. Uh, okay, let's see. I will do a live, or maybe it won't be a live video. Maybe I'll just do a video of myself doing a water change that will uh, give you the visuals and, you know, kind of keeps it down to... A quick uh, educational thing. I don't know that. I mean, I'd have to almost have a second person following me around with a camera, and I can't do that at this time. Um, one person said here, I haven't done a water change in the last four months. I have low nitrates and no phosphates. I dose calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. Do I need to do a water change? Cedric, the question isn't, do you need to do a water change? The question is, how is the livestock doing? If your livestock is doing great, leave it alone. If uh, your livestock is, could be doing better, then it might be worth doing. Matter of fact, you could change some water and see how the tank responds. A lot of the hobbyists that have been doing this for a long time, so I'll call them uh, mature hobbyists, <laughs> they often say that they can totally tell the difference with their tank after a water change. They say their corals are extending their polyps further. They, uh, they seem to be more colorful the next day. And part of that could also be that it took some of the tinge out of the water because the water over time gets that little bit of a greenish tint. And so by changing the water, you're bringing in clear water. Matter of fact, an easy test, take a couple of gallons of brand new salt water in a white bucket and then put another white bucket on the floor next to your tank and drain two gallons and look at them side by side. Odds are the used salt water is gonna look a little yellow. Uh, it might even look a little green. And by pumping out some green water and putting in some clear water, your water clarity is better. The corals are going to look for those nutrients that just got added. They get very excited, and uh, that could be a really good benefit. Mike Farley, sorry. You're not going to see it happen uh, because I'm doing the live chat. Evan Coleman uh, wishes that you could avoid doing water changes on the freshwater side. See, I hear freshwater people change a lot of water. Uh, 
American Reefing says, I do one water change a week, sometimes two, depending on how everything is looking. Now, let me tell you this. The fish store by me, he changes water in his tanks like three times a week. That guy changes water all the time. And yet he's got dosers on his tanks and he's got apexes on his tanks, but he loves changing water and his corals. I mean, they look great. So he's just doing it differently. I mean, you've seen my corals and you've seen how large they grew to the point I had to pull out giant sections. And I'm a guy that does three, four water changes a year, which is why I did the title today. I'm going to change water. It's almost newsworthy. <laughs> And really, I mean, it kind of is, but I just feel like, yeah, I'm going to change some. Plus, I want to completely empty that container because I want to hook up a different pump to it and I want to change the plumbing on it. And uh, I did some water tests today. Where's my results? So I haven't put them on Reef Trace yet because I was doing it in a hurry before the live stream. And today's reef is measuring at 1.025. Alkalinity is 8 dKH. Temperature is 77.5. pH is 8.12. Uh, ORP is 259, it's a little low, but that probe's kind of broken, and I think it's lying at this point, and I'm going to put a new probe in soon. Phosphate is 0.2, uh, calcium is 400, and magnesium is 1300. The uh, salt water of the mix I'm going to change was measuring at 1.027. Uh, alkalinity is at 7, and the temperature is 78.5, so it's pretty close. Now, how I change my water is going to be different than how you change your water, because I don't like to lift buckets. All right, guys, I'm back. Do we still have volume? <laughs> Literally, it just said you've been disconnected. I've never seen that notification before. So I don't know if we're going to lose part of the stream. I <sighs> hope not. We'll see what happens at the end. Okay, good. Um, okay, let me just talk about changing the water itself. Way back, and I don't know where this dropped off. I feel like I'm going to repeat some of this. I apologize in advance. Back in 2002... Back in 2000, I placed my first online order, which I'd never done before. I had, let me switch this, switch this, switch this. Let's do this. I want to look at this camera. Uh, it's just easier for me. Um, back then, we had not changed water. Uh, <laughs> my brain, sorry. Okay, back in 2000, I ordered my first thing online, which was very unheard of. Typically, you buy things in local stores. But I'd heard about a fish store in California, and you could save money, and I decided to order 10 feet of 1-inch tubing and a Rio 2500 pump, and it'd be a lot cheaper than buying a pump and tubing at the fish store. And it ended up being a bargain. And the reason I bought that was so that I could pump water into my tank for water change, because I did not want to lift a bucket. I'd done a few times where you lift a 5-gallon bucket up into my 29-gallon tank, that 29-gallon tank, as I mentioned to you last week, was on a stand that was 42 inches tall, plus the height of the tank. I mean, basically, I was having to lift the bucket up about five feet in the air. And the easiest thing for me to do was to put a chair in front of the tank, stand, step up under the chair with a bucket, lift it up, and pour it in. I didn't like pouring the water into my reef and just dumping it on top of the corals and the rock and making the substrate move. So I thought, that's got to stop. I'm not doing that. I'm not even going to lift these buckets. I'm not doing it. So instead, I got myself the pump and the tubing where I could set the bucket in front of the tank. I could put the pump in there, hold the tubing in front, and I could pour it into the tank. And I'd usually point it at the back wall or at a rock, you know, some bare spot, so the water hitting the rock would disperse into the reef, but it wouldn't, you know, kick up a storm. And that was my method of changing water. Now, I don't know if that's what you like to do, or if you prefer to pour it in a bucket at a time or a, 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 a jug at a time, perhaps. But I really prefer that. But in two, in uh, a few years later, I was doing water changes with my 280-gallon reef, and I had the big sump in the back, and I found that it was a lot easier to pump the water, you know, basically turn off the return pump, turn off the skimmer, and then pump the used water out of the sump into a 55-gallon barrel until it was full. And then I had a second 55-gallon barrel full of brand-new salt water, and I'd pump that back into the sump, and then I turned the return pump on and turned the skimmer on. And that was my water change. And my reason for doing it that way was that way the reef, which had really grown in and was very full, I didn't lower the water level in the display tank. I liked keeping the corals completely submerged. 
it is definitely okay to expose your corals to air for a few minutes. Uh, it will not harm them if it's, you know, five or ten minutes. If you're going to take an hour and a half, you know, that's going to be a little more detrimental to some corals. But typically, it's best to, you know, get the water out, get the water in. And using a pump is a lot quicker than pouring it in. So I really recommend, if you can, pump the water out of the sump and refill it. That's how I like to do it. And in my reef room, I have it set up to where I can drain water into the floor drain. And then I can open a valve and the water pumps right back into the sump. And then I can turn on my return pump. And matter of fact, yeah, at some point I will do a video showing how that all works. But bottom line is, is that I have a button that is connected to my apex. And when I push that button, it turns off a lot of things for about 45 minutes. Turns off the return pump, turns off the skimmer, turns off every heater, turns off the top off. Uh, it turns off, what else? It, it turns off the alarms, you know, the email notifications, all the things are going to alert me something's not right because I took the water away. And then I can refill and after, you know, another 20 minutes or so, it all just bubbles back to life and uh, everything's back to normal. That's my method. But I have a big tank. And I'm sure many of you do not have big tanks and so you're trying to do something different. But when I had my 29 gallon and I wanted to change 10 or 15 gallons at a time, I didn't like that I had to have three five gallon buckets. I wanted something bigger that held all the salt water at once. I didn't want to mix five gallons here and mix five gallons here and mix five gallons here. That just seemed like a beating. And so I was always looking for a better container. And one thing that I did find, I was at Costco, <clears throat> they had a kind of a large round igloo that was designed for parties. And it came with wheels on the bottom and you could put sodas in it and have it for a picnic. And it even had a clear lid you could flip up. Uh, and I thought that was great because you could mix your salt water in that. That held about 12 to 15 gallons of water. Um, it kind of insulated it so it would keep the temperature. And then you, uh, you could just easily roll it to where it needs to be and you could dump it out and rinse it out very simply. And you had all your water volume in one container. If you don't want to go that route because it seems a little pricey, you can just get yourself a regular trash can that's only for your reef tank. Uh, I, I like the brute trash cans. Those are nice. I had found a different type at Home Depot that was dark green, and uh, yet it had the stamp on the bottom that said HDP, yeah, HDPE, which stands for High Density Propylethylene, and that means it's food grade and safe for human consumption. If it's safe for human consumption, it's safe for your reef. So basically, having some kind of a single container to mix your salt water in is great. If you use a large pump to mix up the salt water, it will heat the water. If you don't use a large pump, then you might have to put in a heater in there to get the temperature up, especially in the colder months when your RODI water is so cold coming out of the pipes. So at that point, you need to warm it up. And when you're making your salt water, since we're talking about water changes, you always take your water and add the salt to it. You don't pour the salt in first and then add water gradually because it'll be super saturated at first as it first gets the first couple of gallons of water. And it can even cause a precipitation event where you lose the benefits of the calcium and the magnesium. They might just collapse into a bunch of fluff. How long your salt water should be mixed is uh, highly debated these days. It wasn't debated so much back then. I mean, you know, there's some people that argued, but it, I really see it debated these days. Uh, it used to be some people would mix it up and as soon as it was clear, they used it. I had a rule of always mixing it for 24 hours or longer. Uh, since setting up the fish room now, I have a container that holds 250 gallons to the top of salt water, and that will last me roughly three months or forever, depending on how many water changes I do. And when it comes to that, I just keep it circulating all the time with the lid closed, and that keeps it safe and non-toxic. It doesn't, it's not stagnant. Uh, I have a small pump that just keeps the water moving in a big, huge circle, and that has worked out well for me. And, uh, you know, when I have to do water changes, like I said, I open a valve. I, there's no effort involved. Okay, let's see. I want to see if any of you asked a question. Thank you, Lee. I appreciate you catching me up. Rosie Cutting asked me, have you ever had a sun coral? Are you kidding me? I have an entire page on my website dedicated to sun corals. I want you to go to Google. I want you to type sun coral, Mila's Reef, and hit enter and you will find all my information on it. Sun corals are awesome. I love them. They're one of my favorite LPS corals, even though they're nocturnal as can be. And I fed them and made lots of them. Uh, I've never gone to the point where it just like took over my tank, which is kind of one of those dreams I always thought would be fun to do. But 
I love them. They need to be fed a lot and they need to be fed frequently. So find my page, Sun Corals, Milo's Reef. It's really easy. Uh, Doctor of Welsh Magic says, you would have to collect seawater a mile or so out to sea for it to be clean seawater. He's obviously answering somebody. But see, that's hauling jugs of water, and I don't want to do that. Uh, so some of you that are benefiting from free salt water because you're collecting it from the ocean, congratulations, you're going to have the biggest arms in the world. Let's see. Uh, here's something that also you might benefit from. Masna just came out with an article, and when this video uploads later, I will put the link to that article because I thought it was a good one. It was saying how when you start the siphon on your tank to suck water out, not to suck on the end of the tube because of all the stuff in the water can get into your mouth and into your bloodstream, you know, eventually. Uh, it's definitely not healthy. And if you've done it all this time in your life and nothing bad has happened, congratulations, that's good. But you really want to avoid that. It's uh, not a good thing to do. What I'd like to recommend you do instead, and here's a quick plug for my Instagram. I'd like to recommend, if your return pump is still running, put the hose against the lock line coming out so that way it just pushes water into the siphon and starts your siphon. And then you could unplug the return pump. And now you've started the siphon without sucking the end of the hose. Uh, you can dip the hose into the tank and collect some water and then flip it up and that can start a siphon as well. Uh, you can use a pump in the tank like a maxi jet and you know here's your maxi jet, here's the hose and you just you know plug it on and then plug it into the wall and it will pump water out into your your nearby receptacle which is probably a bucket or a trash can. These are all ways of getting water out of the tank without uh, putting your mouth into the hose and possibly taking in some evil things. You know, the fish are peeing in that water. Don't put it in your mouth. Someone asked me, what salt do you use? I am currently using salinity because I still have, I don't know, half a giant drum of it. Uh, once it's empty, I don't know, I might go to Fritz. Um, it's heavily debated. I used Red Sea Pro Reef years ago. I loved it. Used it for three years. Uh, I've used Kent Salt for a few years. I've used... Uh, Oceanic for a few months. Uh, I've used Fritz in the past. Uh, I might do it again. You know, they're a local uh, distributor here. Yeah, see? Uh, Black Book Productions 10NS said there's a story of a guy that got an infection in his lungs from starting the siphon. And he said it's super rare, but, you know, there's bacteria in the water. It's a marine bacteria and it can get into you. It can cause skin infections, all kinds of stuff. So best to not let that happen. Cedric asks, is there any way to recycle our used aquarium water? <laughs> like letting it dry out to get the salt back. Let me know when you try that project out. Uh, I'm going to just say no. I can't imagine what would be involved in how much water you'd have to evaporate to get down to the original salt crystals. And I don't know how much salt crystals you'd need to make new salt water. Uh, just, just let it go. Where would you place toadstool leathers in your tank, Marco Marcos asks. I had mine on the right end of my tank. <laughs> I know that's not what you meant, but that's hilarious. Uh, you can put it down low. It's a low light coral. It doesn't need a ton of light and it will just grow and grow and grow. Uh, the toadstool leather that I got a long time ago at Macna was this big a frag that I literally was in a workshop and learned how to frag a toadstool leather with a razor blade. And I came home with a little piece of meat uh, in my luggage and I took a rubber band and held it onto a rock in my tank and it turned into a beast this big around over six years. It was amazing and it was beautiful. Matter of fact, it became beautiful when my powder blue tang died. Uh, it turns out my powder blue tang was biting all the polyps since it was always a smooth toadstool. It just looked like this big mushroom looking thing. And when I lost that fish, beautiful fish, I, I miss it. All of a sudden, the toadstool leather turned into this gorgeous coral. I was like, who knew? So that was a really nice uh, upside to a semi-depressing story. All righty. What else is on my list? Oh, another thing that you might want to consider is where your saltwater is mixing. Is it mixing inside or near the aquarium, or is it mixing in the garage 
which is colder? Uh, is it mixing far away? It's best to, I like to have it near the tank. Number one, that way you'll use it up. And number two, typically the pH will be the same in both containers if they're side by side because it's the exact same oxygen in the air. You don't have one that's, let's say it was in the garage, where your cars are, where the lawnmower is, where fumes are. You know, it, not to mention how cold is it in your garage versus how the temperature of your living room where the tank is. So if you could take it and keep that barrel near, that would be best. Uh, that typically helps a lot with temperature and pH matching the display tank. And it also helps you kind of get the project over with. You know, if you mix up salt water and it's sitting right there in your way, you're like, okay, let me do this. If you got it in the other room, you might be like me and just get around to it someday. No, Chris, I will not sing for you. <laughs> All righty. Um, in other news, what do I got to tell you? I had mentioned to you in my live stream, uh, man, I think it was, I think it was two weeks ago that for the beginning of the, you know, coincidentally for the beginning of the year, I was going to the gym and uh, I'm doing it to strengthen my back. And I got myself a personal trainer and I have been going a lot. So I just did this really quickly last night because I'm trying to make sure I'm not getting ripped off. So here is my schedule right now. And everything yellow was a time when I actually trained with a personal trainer. Basically, I've gone for two weeks. And uh, I know a lot of people join a gym at the beginning of the year and then by the end of January they're done and they, they stop or they, they lose the motivation and they go back to their old habits. I, my goal is to keep doing this through the end of March. I want to go January, February, March. That's my goal. And I want to pay for the personal trainer for those three months. And then I'm going to hopefully not need a personal trainer and I can just focus on the things I learned because I know nothing when it comes to going to the gym. Nothing at all. I don't know the equipment. I don't know the stretches. I don't know the equipment names. I don't know the names of the moves. I mean, I'm just an absolute newbie. And I wanted a trainer to teach me everything. And I'm learning about nutrition. And uh, I just tried something new this week that I'm sure you've all tried. And I'm, it was new to me. Almond milk. Turns out stuff's delicious. I had no idea. <laughs> all this time I've seen it on the shelf and I've ignored it. So, um, uh, pretty cool. I, uh, my jeans are literally falling off my body already, but I wasn't, I, I'm not overweight. You know, I didn't have a goal to lose weight. I had a goal to build up muscle in my back so my neck doesn't hurt so much. And two days ago, I noticed these blue jeans are just falling off me and I had to put on a belt to hold them on me. So I'm going to have to get a new pair of jeans. But, uh, there's obviously some kind of, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to, she's not just working on my back, which is what I'd love. I'd, I'd like to just focus on my back and just solve it, but she's doing everything and I'm doing leg day and I'm doing arm day and it's, it's hard and I sweat like crazy and I hate every minute of it, but it's what I'm doing. I don't know if you are similarly motivated this time of year. If you're doing the gym thing, if you're watching what you're eating, if you're, you know, what you're working on, if you want to talk with me about it, you can. Uh, I'm, I'm not looking for advice because I'm going to listen to my trainer. So far, I don't feel like I'm misled at all. Uh, I just wanted to share with you that. Reef tank wise, everything is doing great. Uh, other than me discovering a couple of red bugs in there, I was shocked, shocked I tell you. I was taking a macro shot of the blue tort that I had just secured to the rock with Reef Welder. Reef Welder is this stuff from Marine Depot. There's a blog on my site, milosreef.com slash, go find the blogs. And there's a huge button, follow Mark's blogs, just go there. And uh, you'll see Reef Welder there. And it's the stuff you put in hot water and uh, it turns into a gel that's clear, or in my case, it was a purple one. And then you push it on the coral and press the coral into a rock and it, it cools really quickly. And then the coral stays there. And I took a picture because I wanted to show what it looked like on the rock because people want to see the final product. And I was like, what am I looking at? And I discovered two red bugs. I was very disappointed. And I was... I haven't seen red bugs in my tank since 2006. That's a long time. And I was like, all right. And I saw two. So I talked to the fish store owner and said, can you get me some dragon face pipefish? And he said, yes, he's going to order them for me. And I'm going to try adding a couple of those guys to pick them off. I have a couple of little yellow coarse wrasses in my tank. I have a friend who told me that he has some interceptor, which I might be able to get a couple of pills from him. We'll see. But I took pictures of about four or five other SPS and didn't see any trace of red bugs. 
So that part uh, makes me feel better. The corals are all extending their polyps, which is a good sign. If they were really being infested by these fleas, then I would say that the uh, there was a, a worse... I mean, you could just tell that the, the situation had gotten worse, but that's not the case. Let's see. And, uh... <laughs> Monty Knows It All says, I have huge turf hair algae problem. I'm about to cook my rocks. I saw your video on it. Any additional suggestions? So you're going to take everything out of your tank, all the rock, and you're going to cook it for a few months, and then reset up the tank? What about all your corals and your fish that you have? What's the situation there, Monty? Um, a user that goes by the name G, I think I love you on NCIS. He said, looking to keep alkalinity around 8 or 9, can I use Red Sea's blue bucket instead of the pro that has the higher alk alkalinity? Yeah, I mean, you definitely can. If it's too low, uh, you might have to add some baked baking soda to bring it up. Chris suggests that maybe garlic will get rid of the red bugs. I'm going to tell everyone that Chris recommends garlic to remove red bugs. Jake Atkinson, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'll tell you this. Um, the first week of personal training, I uh, we worked on arms. I I did some stretches. I did some other stuff. And that weekend, I was dead. Matter of fact, I remember I did the live stream and that's the only thing I did all of Saturday and Sunday because I just laid on the sofa and whined to myself about how much I hurt. <laughs> it was so bad. Every time I tried to sit down or get up from the sofa, I hurt. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I can't do anything. I'm literally down for the count. And I was talking, you know, with Frank at the fish store and he, he used to do bodybuilding and all this stuff. And he says, oh, I got good news for you. You will never hurt as bad as you did that weekend because that was your first. And, you know, just think of it that way. And so far he's right because I've been working out and I do feel better. I have a lot to learn. Um, apparently it's going to help me, uh, I don't know, build an endurance. Uh, stamina. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to be able to handle things longer. We'll see. This just, yeah. No, I am not lifting buckets of water, Linda. Thank you, though. Uh, she's making me lift 20-pound weights at a time, and um, yesterday there was 50 on a rack on a thing called a... What did she call it? A Smith machine? I think that was what it was called. And, uh... Yeah, I think that's right. That was hard. <laughs> Uh, my whole goal is my upper back. My lower back isn't really a problem, but she's working on it anyway. So we'll see what happens. Mandrake asks, I washed some bad live rock in bleach. How long to let it dry? I would say that you want to rinse it. Oh, man, I hate that people are putting live rock in these solutions, like acid and bleach. I know why you're doing it, because people are telling you to do it, and I'm just so opposed to it. Okay, if you put any kind of live rock in bleach or acid, you need to put it in some follow-up water, like fresh water or salt water or water with prime. You're probably going to have to let it dry out in the sun for a while. You're probably going to have to, you know, ugh. You need to, I mean, bleach basically evaporates. So if it's out in the air for 24 hours, anything on the surface of the rock will evaporate. Whatever's in the core of the rock will not evaporate. And you know this for a fact because many people talk about how they take dead rock that sat in their garage for nine months or 18 months, no water, and they put it in their tank and all this life comes out of it because it came from the core of the rock. Oh man, I just hate it that people are bleaching rock or, or acid bathing wash, uh, acid bathing their rock. I just, I just don't agree with it. I, uh, I really recommend you cook the live rock in salt water, and it's so easy to do. If you have rock right now, or if you are going to buy rock from someone, get a trash can, throw the rock in there with a power head, throw on a heater if you need to, and throw the lid on it. Turn the lid upside down. 
So, you know, the lid looks like this. Turn it upside down so it's like this. And what'll happen as the water condenses on the lid of the trash can, it'll just drip back down. You don't even have to top it off. Just let it ferment in itself for four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, three years, I don't care. And then occasionally we need a rock out of the barrel, reach in and take one out, it's ready to go. I, you know, okay, that's my, that's my spiel. Daniel Cossie asks, where did you get your 400 gallon tank? Mine came from Marineland. And uh, after 13 months, there was a catastrophic leak, and then they built me a new one. And they literally built the last custom tank ever is mine. Uh, mine was the final one that went off their uh, work table, and they're only making standard ones now. They're not doing anything that's custom. Cuban Reefer is recommending everyone to make reservations for the hotel now as early as possible for MACNA. That's good advice. Uh, I am going to be at MACNA this year. It's September 7th through 9th. It's in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, it should be a great show. It's a three-day event. I recommend everyone go. At some point, I'm sure this channel will be giving away a couple of passes to attend. Um, every single package that goes out that people are buying from Milo's Reef is getting a little postcard reminding them, go to MACNA this year. So if you've ordered something from me recently, you probably got that postcard. Yes. Invert Reef makes a great point. Don't pay for live rock and then kill it. <laughs> Mandrake, I would... We're back to your bleached rock. Okay, um... Man. I think what I would do, if I were you, I would put it in salt water with circulation, and then once a week, change the water. Go ahead and put uh, Seachem's Prime in there as well. Usually it's a cap full per 50 gallons, but since you had bleach involved, let's use twice as much. And I would change the water every single week. And when you're changing, like if you have two trash cans, I would take the trash can everything's sitting in and I would plunge the rock up and down to shake the heck out of it and move that shaken rock into the clean batch of salt water. Let's sit in there. And after, after four weeks, I'm sure it'll be safe to use. I'm sure whatever is in the core of the rock should be uh, okay by that point. But that'd be my recommendation. I'm um, looking at another question here. Uh, Krugi says that he's trying to turn a 38-gallon tank into a sump, and the problem is that it's skinny and tall. Well, the height of a sump can come back to bite you because it gives you a little room to reach in. You know, like there's only so much space between the top of the sump and the bottom of the stand, and you're trying to fit a skimmer all the way down in there. But you keep the water level low in the sump. Uh, you don't raise it up taller just because the sump is taller. Uh, you just think of it this way. The skimmer has to sit in a fixed amount of water height. So like, let's say that skimmer does best in eight inches of water. Well, if you make it 20 inches of water, the skimmer is just gonna overflow. So you keep the water level at eight inches and you have your refugium and you have your return pump. And then when the power turns off, you know that super tall sump can hold all that water and not overflow, and any kind of salt creep and salt spray will stay in the sump, and it won't get all over your cabinet. So you could do that. If you end up needing baffles for that sump specifically, uh, I do cut custom baffles. You can just email me and uh, get me the inside dimension of that tank, measure it very carefully, and I can cut you out some on Minion and get them shipped your way. Oh, something I want to talk about. Somebody talked about their catamorpha is not growing. So I want to suggest... Um, I mean, I want to talk about nitrate for a minute. So people have been asking me, what is the latest information on the export brick? What's it doing for you? And it's been in the tank now for six weeks. I was expecting to see nitrate to come down by now. And the nitrate has not come down. Here are some of my test results uh, that I took today. And uh, the ELOS test kit maxes out at 25 ppm. And when it maxes out, it's fuchsia. It is bright, hot pink. And my, uh, yeah, you barely saw that. Uh, the color is still a bright fuchsia. <laughs> so it hasn't happened yet. I, would, I felt like it was a little bit less today, uh, just based on what it looked like when I first mixed it up. But then you wait for five minutes, and of course it gets deep, deeper in color. And uh, I thought, oh, I think that brick is working. But I'm, I have high hopes that in the next couple of weeks, it's gonna come down. We'll see, and when it does, I'll let you know. Now, uh, Jennifer, I don't know why your keto has stopped growing. 
It could be that there's not enough flow in that zone. It could be that the light needs to be cleaned off because there's a lot of salt covering the lens. Uh, it could be a lack of nutrients in the water. You know, what are your nitrate? What are your phosphates? Ben McCoy asks, what do you do for a living? I sell products from Mila's Reef. Uh, Mila'sReef.com has been my own website for over 15 years. And back in 2009, I made it my sole source of income. I build custom aquarium pro uh, products for people, uh, like sumps, top-off containers, uh, fan brackets, uh, Vortec driver holders, um, uh, top-down photo boxes, lots of sumps, um, frag tanks, lots of acrylic wares I build. And you can see all that on the website. And I sell a lot of products. I sell things from Coral View, from Ecotech, from uh, Blue Life. Like I talk about Phosphate RX, I sell that. Um, I, safety Stop. The, uh, what else do I sell? Uh, the Elos test kits that I like. I sell the things I use myself because I believe in them. And I, I prefer to only put things on my website that I use. Chris's answer is so much quicker. He sells things from his online shop. That's true. <laughs> Cuban Reefer asked a great question. Thank you. Uh, do you stir the sand when you do a water change? No, I don't, because I'm taking the water from the sump. I don't touch my sand bed. I like to put things in the tank that will stir the sand automatically every single day, like Neisseria snails, cucumbers, uh, little hermit crabs. And it's actually time for me to replenish my cleanup crew. I have very few critters in my tank right now. I think the, the most cleanup crew I have are cucumbers and asterinas. Uh, I need snails badly. I need hermit crabs. I'd like to get, I don't know, an urchin or two. I'd like to add some critters. Uh, Invert Reef asked, would you go back to bio pellets? My biopower reactor is still running, but I haven't added any pellets because I want the brick to prove itself. I'm hoping it will work. Uh, Mandrake recommended dosing iron to help with the ketomorpha. Uh, so Jennifer, maybe that would help you if you're not dosing iron. That's true. That will help plants grow. Yeah, matter of fact, Lee, uh, Lee says, doing what you love. That's nice. Uh, matter of fact, it's funny. My uh, personal trainer told me Mark, you need a new hobby to relax. You turned your hobby into a business, so you need a new hobby. And so, you know, it took me a couple days to think of what to say to that. So I told her, going to the gym is my new hobby. <laughs> I know for some people that's a lifestyle, but you know, I don't really want to make the gym my lifestyle. I don't want to be going to the gym three, four times a week for the rest of my life. That's not my, my desire. But it, it's fine for now, and it's something I, I consider it a necessary evil and I think it'll make me feel really happy that I did it. I, I think it's gonna be something that I set my mind on doing, and uh, I'd like to say I accomplished it, I hit the goals I set, and I'm gonna move forward with my life. So I've already got another hobby in mind. Um, it's gonna cost me a little bit of money, but as some of you probably already know that I love Comic-Con, and I love going to the San Diego Comic-Con every year. That's a great chance to meet all kinds of people. And of course, I'm always looking for aquatic art while I'm there and meeting artists that make things that have to do with the ocean. Like this shirt. This shirt came from Comic-Con. I love it. But uh, one of the things that I've seen the last few years that has definitely caught my eye repeatedly is they have a life-size R2-D2. And the guy uses a remote control, looks like a PlayStation controller, and he has it rolling around and the top is spinning and he's whistling and chirping and you know all the kids are delighted. I want to make an R2 unit. I think that would be really cool. So that could be my next hobby. And it has nothing to do with what I do for a living, which I think is a great uh, choice. So that would be my next one. Scuba diving is a nice, relaxing choice. Chris says that relaxes him. I don't find that as relaxing as he does. I find that there's too many things that can go wrong when it comes to diving. That's funny. I'd never seen that before. Anthony McKay's advice actually had a message saying that it had to be approved whether it would show that one. And he was saying adding sodium thiosulfate would help neutralize the bleach. So I read that out loud because I know this chat box won't show up later when the video is uploaded for everyone else. Um, I think that says nice dragon. Do you offer private consultations? Yes, I do. And I can do that via Skype. Uh, I can do it through FaceTime. And of course, uh, there's been times where I've actually driven out or flown to a destination for private consultations. Uh, Jose Moria asks, have you used AcroPower? Great question. 
I have Acro Power. I have a whole gallon of it, and I always forget to use it. Uh, I've got friends that swear by it. They just love it. And they set it up to a dosing pump to add automatically. And I think that would probably be the best way for me to use it is if I were to hook it up to a pump and let it trickle in each day. That way it actually happens because I've probably had that bottle for two years and I'd say three quarters of the jug is still full. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, contact me through my website. That'd be perfect. All right, guys, a couple last questions maybe. Chris is asking me. I mean, he's joking. He's saying he'd like me to fly out and help him do his next water change. Yes, that's exactly right. Mandelstam says, check out astromech.net for the R2 builders. I know about that club. It's a national club. That's why I was asking questions about because you join this group and you can learn how to build an R2 unit with people of like-mindedness. And apparently, because there's so many people in this group, it can help you save money on buying the different parts you need. Like the dome that goes on top. Asking some guy locally to make me that dome would cost a fortune. But by joining that club... There's basically, it's the premise of a group buy. And, you know, 15 of these domes get purchased at once and it saves everyone money because the company makes 15 and then they're done until the next batch order comes in. So I would do that. Uh, my neighbor who lives across the street, super nice lady. She's been fighting cancer for years. She came over yesterday, uh, a couple days ago. She needed a ride to the store and... Uh, she stood in front of my reef and she said, I could just stand here all day. She totally agrees with you, Cedric. Just being in front of the reef. I love my reef. And I've been, like, I think that's why I'm taking so many pictures lately. It, it's doing really well. Um, I think I mentioned this already once. I haven't lost any corals of any kind. You know, in the old days, something would just go up in smoke. And I was like, why? What happened? And technically, you know, my water's not perfect. My nitrates are up. I mean, they're above 25 probably 40 or 50 and yet my corals tolerate it um and my phosphates are 0.2 today you know they're not low but i know a lot of people swear by you know having it as close to zero as possible they want that ultra low nutrients i i'm a feeder I, that's what i do but my corals have adapted now if i can wean off some of the nitrate and phosphate that'd be great but i'm not chasing the number so hardcore that it stresses out the corals because like i said i planted these corals in my tank that Dwayne brought me last september they're all growing they've i'd say tripled in size since i got them my own shadow caster is bursting out with tips that's why i keep taking pictures of it the anemone the sea bay anemone is probably two foot in diameter it's just this massive beast compared to the video i shared two and a half years ago two and three quarter years ago where it was about this big you know it's it's a humongous thing Oh, Tim, I don't like hearing that. He said that uh, he's had the export brick in his system for three months and the nitrates have not gone down. I kind of want to put a second brick in, <laughs> but we'll see. Monty knows all. Do you sell merchandise on your website like reefing t-shirts? Yes, you can find them under reef wares. Um, Jose says, if my water parameters are stable and on point for these two weeks, do I need to do a water change? Or can I keep testing and play it by there? I would leave it alone. I would change water once a month. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Black Book Productions says, there are so many beautiful tanks now that have such high PO4 and NO3 or phosphate and nitrate. And it's almost like a dirty secret. <laughs> You're like, Oh, I love your tank. It's so beautiful. But, you know, we very rarely say, tell me your parameters. And so when they post them, people are like, what? How did you grow that if your parameters are so horrible? And I just feel like the parameters are just what they are. I mean, usually we tend to share the parameters when things go wrong. That's when we post questions and we, we panic and we, we grab our... Oh, here's one. Okay, test kits. A guy told me yesterday that for the last year, his tank has just been declining and his acros are dying left and right. And everything was measuring fine. Well, he discovered that his test kit was lying to him about calcium for a very long time and because he got a new kit. And he learned the hard way. And he said, you know, now he's trying to rebuild. But if things don't turn around in the next two months, he's quitting the hobby. You know, it's sad, but that's the thing. So if you are testing your tank and your tank isn't doing well, but your numbers are coming back right, it's time to double check the test results. If that means spending $100 on all new kits 
to remeasure, do it. If you want to spend 50 bucks and ship your water to a testing facility called ICP, they will measure it for you and give you their report. If uh, you want to just take a water sample to your local fish store and have them test the water with their kits, you can compare against your test results that you took that day side by side. You know, so like you check alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, uh, salinity, then have them measure those and then look at them side by side and make sure that they match. And if their number for alkalinity is like four points lower than yours or their calcium is 300 higher than yours, find out why. You know, what's going on? Um, I was asked, do you ship t-shirts worldwide? I have shipped a few shirts internationally. I sent a few to Australia. Uh, shipping just costs what it costs. Uh, the, <laughs> the guy that won the book in the live stream a couple of weeks ago, I took it to the post office yesterday. And... I told him I need to ship at book rate. I'm just sharing this story with you because I'm annoyed. Uh, you know, I'm, ha I'm happy he won it. And uh, so I said, book rate, please. And she said, you can only do book rate within the United States. And this is going to Canada. Well, Canada's our neighbor. And I mean, literally, there's not even water between our countries. I just feel like it's, it's north, okay? So instead of it being like nothing to mail this book, it was $24 to ship a book. A book. I mean, it's like a really fat letter. <laughs> anyway, congratulations on your book, Corey. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. Read every page. Uh, do you keep a heater in your refugium, Tim Harris asks. My heater is in the return zone. That's where I have mine. I have three of them. And, each, and the reason I have three is so that way if one were to fail, it doesn't have enough power to cook my livestock. Let me switch cameras again. I'm sure you're bored of this angle. Let's do this. And we'll stick this on there. Instagram, follow me on Instagram. By the way, uh, going off topic real quick, I know you guys like to follow live streams. I mean, you're doing it right now. There's one person I was told about. I don't remember his name, but he apparently does 12-hour live streams. Is there a reason for that? I mean, is that something you would tune in for? Do you like super crazy long live streams, or do you just kind of like log in for a few minutes and bounce out? I don't know why he's doing it for so long. If you know, I'd love to hear why. I mean, I guess it's possible to just do a Q&A for 12 hours, but it sounds exhausting. One person asked about Miracle Mud. Um, Monty s says that he has his heater next to his, uh, his brick. That's fine. Just in an area of the tank where, or the area of the sump where water flows over it. I like to pick the return zone because my water goes through the baffles and then it flows right across the heaters as it goes to where the return pump is. So I just, I don't want to be in a spot where water's not moving. I want the water to be heated so that the tank temperature stays like it belongs. Uh, Jennifer Ritchie asks about the new... Uh, actually, I think someone else did first because it scrolled up away. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, yeah, Muzzle Loader asked it first. Uh, Auto Aqua makes a Smart ATO uh, and the Smart ATO Micro. And then about two years ago, they came out with the... Uh, I don't know, they probably call it Smart Water Change. <laughs> uh, but they have an, a water change system, and it's basically their top-off device that will move water out and move water in. It's basically the same principle as using dosing pumps, but they use their little cute, adorable pumps to move water back and forth. And you can set this up to change water automatically. One very important point, man, I wish I'd mentioned this earlier because some people don't watch the entire video. If you set up an automatic water change system, it is so important that you measure your salinity every single week, no matter what. I mean, that is the absolute rule for an automatic water change system because your salinity can really wander. And you would think, well, there's no way. My tank is 1.026 and my new salt water is 1.026. They will be fine. But that's not the case because you're forgetting one very important thing, and that's your protein skimmer. The skimmer is always pulling water out. And it might be pulling out a little bit. It might decide to pull out a lot. And when the skimmer starts wasting a lot of water one way or another, it's going to affect salinity because your top off is going to add more water to replace what was lost. And if your skimmer pulls out, let's just say three gallons of water, and your top-off adds three gallons of fresh water, 
and you know, like, later on your automatic water change comes on and changes two gallons, two gallons, and you know the next day two gallons, two gallons. And like let's just say once a week your skimmer goes crazy and dumps out a gallon or two of water. Over time your salinity will lower and lower and lower. There was a guy in my own club, and that's how I learned this. You know, it's not something I lived through. I I read stuff and I don't forget. <laughs> it's really important to learn from each other's mistakes. And there was a guy in our club who had an automatic water change system. He set it up, um, basically ran it for about six months, and watched his tank just decline. And he thought, well, that's so strange. I'm changing all this water. I'd never changed so much water in my life. My reef should be rocking. And instead, it, it just was not pretty. He posted, I told him, post some pictures. Let's see what you're talking about. And it wasn't pretty. It wasn't doing well. And it turns out his salinity had dropped to 1.019. And he didn't even know because he hadn't checked. He hadn't pulled out a refractometer in over six months. So if you want to set an automatic water change system, then every Saturday or whatever day of the week you like, check your salinity make sure it's on target. As long as it's on target, automatic water change yourself to death. Knock yourself out. I mean, what are you spending money on water and salt? Who cares, right? You can do that as much as you want. Uh, I'd, I have played with the thought of an automatic water change system only mentally for about five years. I keep thinking, I kind of want to do it. And then I think, well, how much do I want to change a day? If I change three gallons a day, that would be 90 a month. If I change five gallons a day, you know, it's 150 gallons a month. You know, how much water do I want to change? I'm already a guy that barely changes 55 gallons every three months. But I thought, you know, that's interesting, and maybe I want to do it. But I don't. I have trust issues. I just know Murphy is always watching, looking for a way to ruin my tank, and I try not to give him a lot of options. So I've kind of taken that one away. So that's my answer. Uh, if you want to do it, do it. Uh, and their device probably do a great job. I know some people are using the Dose from Apex or Neptune Systems with their Apex to do automatic water changes. I have a friend here in Texas, down south, who set up one and did it for about six or eight months. And then he sent me a message uh, and says, I'm not doing that anymore. So uh, it seems to be one of those things you think is neat, and it, but I don't really find people doing it on a regular basis. Maybe it was Rico's Reef, yeah. Uh, I don't know who it was, honestly. But uh, the super long uh, streams, I don't really understand... I don't even know how he gets paid. Because, <laughs> you know, YouTube pays us nickels and dimes for what we do on YouTube. So, you know, over time, those nickels and dimes add up, and it's nice. But a 12-hour stream, uh, what does that, how does that work? I don't know. Um, <sighs> Cuban Reefer says that I'd mentioned before about a refractometer that was made for 35 PPT salinity. And I do think it's a Red Sea refractometer. There's also a DD, which is what I call the Deltec, because uh, DD Creations is Deltec. Uh, they had a refractometer that's made to be calibrated with salinity solution or 35 PPT solution. And in general, I tell everyone, I don't care whose re refractometer you have. I don't care if it's digital or if it's the kind you hold up to your eye and you look at a bright light. Those should be calibrated with salt water, with 35 PPT solution. Uh, there's a product that I saw on my website called Accuracy. I love that, Accuracy, S-E-A. And uh, I love how Two Little Fishies uh, keeps it fun. So Accuracy is 35 PPT solution, and you can put a few drops inside your, uh, your refractometer. Or if you have a swing arm you know, that lifts up and down, you can pour it in, and you can see if that... Uh, Swing arm ref uh, what is that? It's not a refractometer. Uh, it's a spe specific gravity measurement tool. Uh, you can make sure it's measuring 35 PPT. If it's not, can you adjust it? If you can adjust it, you can calibrate it. And if you can calibrate it, you're going to get the best results. <clears throat> Yeah, it might be a hydrometer. See, I'm thinking a hydrometer is a glass one that you hang in. I haven't had one of those in forever. Uh, when I grew up, my dad had a hydrometer, and you would drop it down inside the water, and then it would bob up and down. You could measure the salinity of the water. Boy, that was a long time ago. I was 11 years old when I saw that. And I've seen some over the years. Matter of fact, back in 1998, I bought one for myself. But a couple years later or so, maybe four years later, I got a refractometer. And matter of fact, I had it forever. And I've got a new one now, but I'm using the Milwaukee Digital Refractometer. If you're on my Instagram, 
you would have seen a picture of it that I posted today. So uh, I've had that one probably five years. It cost me about a hundred bucks, maybe a little bit more. I think I found on Amazon. And I can pour the 35 PPT solution on it and make sure that the display reads that. And if it reads that, I know I'm calibrated correctly. The reason I don't recommend calibrating your refractometer with uh, RO water is because you're measuring at the wrong end of the scale. We're trying to make sure our water is 1.026, 1.027, 1.025, right there. But if you're calibrating at zero, this can be a much wider swing if there's an error. So getting 35 PPT solution is right in the dead center, 1.0265. Yeah, 1.0265. And that's what you, you want to make sure that you're as close to that target area because that's the area we're measuring. We're not measuring close to zero. All right, guys. <laughs> Chris, Chris, you're killing me today. You're hilarious. He was just joking because I've been on this thing for over an hour. And he says, only 11 hours to go. I'm like, no, no. I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy the stream. Uh, I, I do feel at some point I will do a water change video. Uh, but I've got um, several I must do first. Fiji, I need to get it done. Uh, I need to do one on the calcium reactor. Um, I've got a Macna video that... It's so late that it's going to be a great commercial for the new Magna. <laughs> I'm horrible. I, I just can't get them all out back to back like that because I also spend a lot of my time building things. Like today, as soon as I got up, I started gluing the top of a top-off container for a customer who ordered a custom size. And I put that picture on Instagram as well. So if you're not on my Instagram, follow me over there because it's an awesome place to be. And it, it's, it's free. You can just enjoy it. Guys, have a great weekend. Test your water. Post your results. If you don't have the Reef Trace app, get it because you can put all your results in there and you can share it through social media, which is great. Um, I want to see your test results. I'm going to be posting mine in a few minutes. Uh, do hashtag water testing, hashtag post your results at Me Loves Reef so I can see it. Make sure it's public. If it's set to private, I can't see it. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I will talk with you guys next week.